Welcome in. So now we finally actually get to start looking into the principles of design. And the first principle we're going to be talking about today is balance. Okay, so balance, what is it? So in the real world, we measure balance by using physical weight, but in the art world, the unit of measurement is not weight, but visual interest. So in order to have a balanced composition, we have to have a balanced amount of interest throughout the piece. So think of it like cooking. Interest is like seasoning, and your composition is like your dish, and you have different seasonings you use for different dishes that you make, and the most important part is that you have to have the right amount of seasoning sprinkled throughout your entire dish, throughout your whole composition. Does that make sense? So we have to do two things. First, we have to find out what seasonings we have available to us, that is, the types of interest that we have at our disposal that we can learn how to play with. And then second, we have to know how much seasoning to use, that is, how much of these techniques do we use in our paintings to make sure that our composition ends up balanced at the end. So this is the big question, the big question that we all need to ask ourselves about balance every time I want to sit down and create. You ready? The big question, how do we create individual interest to create balance in our composition as a whole? And the answer is with symmetry. So little s symmetry is used to create interest and big s symmetry is used to create balance throughout the whole piece. Let me explain. So big S symmetry, small S symmetry, what's the, like, symmetry is symmetry. Like, I don't understand. Why are you capitalizing the letters? Because it's, it's complicated. So think of it this way. So we want to create this really nice composition that's nice and balanced. We want to create a nice dish, right? So we're in our kitchen. We go over to our cupboard. We go to the spices section. Our big spices cupboard is labeled symmetry with a big capital S. And we open it up inside, and there's three lowercase s, little s symmetries in there that are radial symmetry, basic vanilla meta symmetry, and then asymmetrical symmetry, right? So you have little s symmetry inside the big s symmetry spice cupboard, right? Does that make sense? Stay with me, it's a little bit hard to understand, but think of it like a Russian doll, right? They're both symmetry, but the big capital S, big S symmetry cupboard is like the biggest Russian doll, and then you open it up and you have smaller Russian dolls inside of it. So what this means, these little s symmetry spices, right? So radial symmetry, basic vanilla symmetry, and asymmetrical symmetry, they're all inherently symmetrical to themselves. They're perfect, just the way that they are. And you're gonna take these little, perfect, little s symmetry spices, right? And you're gonna take this little perfection, and you're gonna sprinkle this little perfection into your not yet perfect composition. And the sum of the parts, the sum of all these small little s symmetry perfected spices that you're sprinkling onto your dish, that is going to make the whole piece be capital S symmetrical balanced. I say all this because when we're talking about symmetry, you have to know what they are as a standalone concept, what radial symmetry is, what the basic vanilla, you know, what everybody knows symmetry to be, and then asymmetrical symmetry. You have to know what all of those are as standalone concepts, and then you can take those standalone concepts and apply them to your composition as a whole so that your entire composition can have flavors of those types of symmetry that you use and ultimately be that kind of symmetry. All right, you with me? So we wanna make a balanced composition. We wanna make a balanced meal. So we go to our cupboard, we go to our spices section with capital S symmetry, we open it up, we get our little S symmetry spices ready to put on our dish so it becomes balanced. And the first little S spice that we pick up is radial symmetry. So radial symmetry creates balance by points of interest radiating outward from a central point of interest. So it, the, like the most common example of this would be like a bicycle tire and all the spokes coming out from that central core middle part, right? You also see a lot of this in cylindrical shapes like towers and it's really, really easy to see radial symmetry if you look at it in your mind's eye like from the top down, right? Like it's like if you, if you cut a cake, right? And you cut in all the pieces, all of the tips of the pieces are in the center of the cake. That's radial symmetry. And so if you wonder if something is radial or not, if it's cylindrical, it probably is. And if not, just look at it like from the top. And if it's radiating outwards, that is radial symmetry. So now these two examples right here, this is a perfect example of what I mean by little s symmetry and big s symmetry. And the laser one up on top, the actual laser sci-fi fantasy device itself 
is radial in its design, right? But the actual composition itself, if you were to print that and put it on your wall, the composition of the piece as a whole is asymmetrical. It's not radial whatsoever. But there's a part of that radial symmetry, the actual tower, present in the composition. It's a part of the larger piece. Does that make sense? It's the same with the Citadel concept art down below. The Citadel is actually technically radial with, you know, all of the different petals peeling off of that central circle in the middle. But if you were to print that out and put it on your wall, the actual composition is asymmetrical. You rarely actually see the whole composition being radially symmetrical. If you did, it would look like this. And you don't see very many of these. So that's radial symmetry. If the whole composition is radial symmetry, it looks like this and it looks balanced and it's very nice. And we're like, oh, that's complete, right? That's radial symmetry. So next up is just your basic meta Joblo average vanilla symmetry that everybody knows is what happens when you put a mirror up next to something and it's just the mirror image on the other side, either vertically or horizontally. And this works. And sometimes it looks really cool. Like these concepts are awesome, but it's really, really, really heavy handed and obvious that it's like exactly symmetrical. Because of that, you typically want to reserve this for really regal or royal settings like a throne room or something dramatic because it's so heavy handed and obvious. Like, like it really stands out that, oh look, look, it's symmetry. Like yes, the composition's balanced, but it's also just way too on the nose. So a good tool to have, but just be careful. They don't want to overuse it. You want to use it in small doses. And when you do use it in small doses, oh, it's beautiful. But just be careful. Now, last but not least, we have asymmetry to create balance. And asymmetry inherently sounds unbalanced because asymmetry means that it's not you know, like that regal throne room. So it's like, wait, how do you unbalance the asymmetry to make balance in the end? Like, ah. And the answer is that if you think of radial symmetry and, you know, traditional symmetry as using the same unit of measurement, like using the same weight, right? And it's like one on this side, one on this side. Either you mirror it this side to this side, you know? But with asymmetry, it's the sum of its parts. So you can use a bunch of smaller different things that ultimately end up to be the same weight visually. They ultimately create the same amount of visual interest on like either side, does that make sense? So you get to have more tools to play with to actually create balance. And it's because that you get to have more tools that asymmetry is by far the most common form of creating balance in compositions, by far. So now that we know that asymmetry is, creates balance by the sum of its all its little parts, we have to know what all those little parts are that enable it to create balance in the end. And spoiler alert, really, all those different little parts are, are just different forms of contrast. And contrast is another principle of design that we're gonna talk about, but it's basically contrast and a bunch of different ways of applying contrast to create balance in the end. So what are these forms of contrast? How do they create balance? Well, I'm so glad you asked. And we're going to look at a piece done by Aton, of course, because he's amazing. And we're going to see how he uses all of these forms of contrast in this total asymmetrical design. Here, I'll put it up, that one. See, it's not, it's not symmetrical and it's not radial, the composition itself, if you were to frame it up, is asymmetrical, but it is also balanced. How? And he does this in just six ways. So first up, we have balance by value, and all this means is that you have a small area of high contrast amidst the larger composition as a whole that's relatively low contrast. In this case, it's that bright orange diagonal down the center of, you know, the piece. Like, that's what we look at because that bright line takes us right to the darkest bit underneath the central tower. And that's where we start and that's our focal point. That's what instantly gets our attention. And that's a contrast of value. But he's really sneaky about it because not only is it our first point, a contrast of value, but it's the second point. It's a contrast of color. So in the same way he has that contrast by value, he also has the contrast by color because it's the most vibrant, saturated color among all the other muted colors of his composition. So it's like a two for one. It's brilliant. He knocks it out of the park. He does this actually a lot in a lot of his pieces and they naturally go together because it just it makes most sense for contrast by value and contrast by color to coincide. Third happens when you have a balance with shape. And this is awesome because most everything in this piece is jagged and sharp. Like even just the focal point, that line on the side, is a, it's literally just a sharp diagonal. But you have this really nice soft curve 
of the dome right next to it. You have another dome in the distance, and then you have that little hill right behind everything. And it's this contrast of those, just those three gentle curves contrasting with all the sharp edges and all the diagonals that are really angular and dynamic really creates this sense of unity and balance throughout the piece. And it's just, it's so subtle and you don't even realize that he's doing this if you weren't looking for it. You're like, oh yeah, that looks cool. But that's what it is. It's awesome. So the third one is balance by shape, all right? Shape. So we have value, color, and shape. The fourth way to create balance is through texture. So look at the centerpiece, look at the main beef of it, that line in the sand. It's just a line, that's all it is, just a freaking brush stroke. But it looks awesome, it looks sexy, and there's nothing to it. But right next door, you have all the detail in the world with the grit on the dome, the people standing there, you know, you see the metal on the side of it, you see all of this detail that you can sink your teeth into, then that's it, really. I mean, some of it else is like rendered kind of, but it's all a lot. It's not as crisp, it's not as sharp, and it really keeps your attention at the focal point of where he wants you to have it be there. And that contrast of texture really makes every, again, subconsciously, you're like, oh, that makes sense. You know, contrast in, of texture here, but then everywhere else, it's just kind of, you know, the same. Like, and it creates that, all the more contrast, the more interest. And it's, it's just this giant little dance he plays where he has most of the texture in the center where he wants it, but yet the actual center itself, the line, doesn't have much texture at all. So there's a contrast of texture within the focal point itself. Like, it's brilliant. It's so subtle, you wouldn't even know about this if you were looking for it. So, texture. Great, great job. Keeping the texture around your focal point and even then creating a dissonance and a contrast of your texture within the focal point itself. Texture. Awesome. Like, if you can do this, instantly separating yourself from so many of your peers. The fifth one is positioning, and this is cool. So imagine, you know, you see those planes on the far hand side, imagine, like just take them out in your head and just imagine they're not there. Like now it feel, you're like, oh, that doesn't feel right. Like you know that, and that's why he put them in. But he made them small so they wouldn't distract from the focal point of the dome sand line thing he had going on. And like, it just, it just, it's, you have all of this weight, but it's just a little bit of an interest off to the side. And the cool thing is, I don't know if you noticed this, but he has dissonance and var variety in his lines. So the planes are horizontal, the dome is curved, and then the, you know, the spear thing, whatever that antenna is, on the right side of the frame is vertical, straight up. So you have a vertical, a horizontal, and then a curve, all around the same, you know, top third of the frame. Right, so and that's like that's another form of contrast and variety. But like what I'm talking about, this is, this is about this is five. This is about position, right? But making sure that you have things balanced and set apart, so there's no like empty negative space. But to be creative about it, so that everything goes back to accenting and highlighting your focal point, right? So that big spear on the top right, it stops your eye from going off the page. Which, speaking of which, the last one, number six, is eye direction. So it's really, really cool how he does this. This is like so nuanced. This is like master tier, top tier how he does this. How he directs your eye by doing all of the five things we did before. It all comes down to this. The little, like this happens in less than two seconds. Less than a second, your eye goes on this journey and Eitan is more than aware that you're going on this. Like, he made this just for you. So you start off with the big streak in the sand, the most contrast, contrast by value, contrast by color, and you go down to where the most contrast is right underneath the shed. Then the contrast of texture to create balance, you're like, oh, what's this cool little sand thing right here? And you look up, and you see the dome, you see the grease, the two little people there, and then you see, oh, there's this trail behind them, what's that? And you follow them all the way over to the jets, and you're like, oh, these are kind of cool. And then you have that little rolling hill that rolls you down, and you're like, oh, hey, cool, this is nice, this is nice, it's gentle, it's you know, a contrast to the horizontal line that brought you all the way over. And if you draw an imaginary line from that hill, it takes you all the way down to the foreground on the bottom where you see the dark gray, and you're like, oh, what's all this? This is kind of cool, this is kind of neat. And then you fall all the way straight back up to the spire, boop, and now you're right back at the orange slice, right in the middle. And you can start the whole trip all over again. It, brilliant. Just by contrast, like, that's so insane. Like, so much thought went into that. And so often we're just like, oh, that kind of looks cool, I guess. Here, it's done. And it's like, no. Like, eye direction, like, that is the cherry on top. If you have good eye direction, if you map out the eye direction that your audience doesn't even know that they're taking, like, they are completely unaware that you are, like, taking them by surprise and making them look at your piece a certain way. If your eye direction covers the entirety of your composition, you know that it's balanced. You know that it's balanced. And 
since you have eye direction in the back of your head anyway, you're formatting everything in your composition to make that eye map, to make that eye direction work and to make it flow. You're not throwing in needless detail that doesn't belong there because it's not a part of your eye direction. So really eye direction is just your final test at the end of it, like, hmm, I wonder if my composition's balanced. Ask yourself what your eye direction is. And the end result, honestly, is it makes you feel whole. It makes you feel complete. Like you look at that and you're like, oh, that looks nice. I just want it to like, good piece. I appreciate that. It's like the end of a perfect meal. A perfect meal, like a perfect painting, leaves you full. So we gotta learn how to cook a balanced meal using all the good spices in our symmetry spice cupboard with big S symmetry and little S symmetry. And if we do that, mm, it'll just leave us full. It'll be nice, we'll be content. So thanks so much for watching. That's the first principle of design. All of that, all of that like juicy, crazy, like mind bending goodness is just one principle of design and there's so many more of them. It's awesome. Next week we're gonna keep going with principles of design and I will see you next time.